and even without hit records from the label, Rough Trade Distribution's turnover was huge. Ad hoc arrangements with independent record stores had been formalized into a sales network called The Cartel, which supplied over 300 shops with records from over 500 labels. But as some of these labels began to enjoy massive sales, it became obvious that in business terms, Rough Trade's inexperienced staff were way out of their depth. We had no business experience in those days. We had to make it up as we went along. And as a result of just the pure volume going through and so on, so on, so forth, we actually ran into financial difficulties fairly regularly. I think the first problem arose out of uh, the Joy Division record, Unknown Pleasures. They ran out of money before they could pay the factory. A similar thing happened with Mute as well. Because Mute had two big records, had the first Depeche Mode record, and then the first Yazoo record. And again, the money wasn't managed very well, so that by the time it came around to pay me, they'd, they'd already spent the money, basically. Following a series of cash flow crises, Rough Trade brought in its first qualified accountant in 1982. He found the company was close to going bust. A financial audit revealed that the company owed money it simply didn't have. The record label and distribution system were Rough Trade's core activities. If they were to be saved, everything else would have to be sacrificed. That meant disposing of the shop. You know, I'm not really, I don't know too much about that. I have to say, I think I must have been distracted by something else because I was, you know, I can't remember being particularly party to discussions about what was gonna to happen to the shop. So it's, that's lost to me in that, in that difficult period. We were called in to a meeting, uh, as I recall, sort of individually, you know, and told that they were going to shut the shop. We felt kind of betrayed. And so we went back to Jeff and, and said, you know, if we can keep the name, can we carry on with the shop? In December 1982, six years after opening, the Rough Trade shop was sold to three of its staff. They kept the name and still run the shop today. Financial collapse for now had been averted, but the crisis exposed the rift between the label and Rough Trade's distribution arm. Jeff asked me to leave at that time, just completely out of the blue, uh, which came as a bit of a shock, uh, but after talking to others there, I was then persuaded not to. Who asked him to leave? He said that you did. Well, yeah, I, I really, I can't remember. What was it, I wonder what he did. I think he was being more and more antagonistic, really. But, yeah. He thought that I'd, that I'd, I'd been personally responsible for some of the worst losses. I, I could then, then never actually regard or deal with Jeff in the same way. From that point on, it seemed to me that the record label became completely the sort of domain of, of, of Jeff, whereas the distribution was, you know, being masterminded by Richard. The conflict between record label and distribution would never be resolved. The communal vibe of Rough Trade's early days seemed a long way away. Way before you could relax and do your thing and get through, now you had to be, you know, you had targets, you had this to do, and if you didn't keep the targets, they'd be meeting, why haven't you kept your targets? Targets. So there's a lot of pressure put on people. You know, that mood of, you know, you can kick back and I'll do it tomorrow, all that had gone. And then you, you got people starting getting worried because of um, job security, you know, when, uh, you know, when if this wasn't selling or this group didn't do their thing or, you know, didn't sell enough units. And rough trade, we never talk about 
selling records as units. Rough Trade's rapid growth had raised some difficult dilemmas. Distribution demanded increased record sales to drive its ever-expanding operation. The record label needed commercial success, but fiercely guarded its independent identity, built on the alternative credibility of its music. The perfect solution to all these problems came from a pair of ambitious songwriters from Manchester. The only way that I could find any mental relaxation is to simply go out and walk, which can seem quite depressing to most people. But for me, it was perfect fuel, because then I would go home and I would write furiously. And I found that, for me, it was a brilliant outlet. It was the thing that helped. But also, you have to have a grain of hope, which is a very difficult thing to have. The first day that we were officially like a partnership, which was the second time we got together, part of our get-together was just making this almost like mental wish list, if you like. And um, part of that conversation was we should sign to Rough Trade Records. On a Friday afternoon in April 1983, Johnny Marr walked into the Rough Trade offices with a demo tape. I said uh, I wanted to see Jeff Travis and I was, I was kind of um, hustled out, really. But I kind of hung around, kind of pretending to be like um, doing stuff with records. And I was in there for an hour or two. And then uh, I saw Jeff come out of his office and I think he was a little taken aback. I think I actually <laughs> grabbed his sleeve and uh, stopped him because he was trying to get away. And I gave him this cassette and I said, uh, I'm from Manchester, this is my band, The Smiths. And something along the lines of, you won't have heard anything like this before. I took it home that weekend and listened to it about 20 times. and was really intrigued by it. We couldn't really make out the words, but it was something wonderful. To Jeff's absolute credit, he called first thing on Monday and just said, this is the best thing I've heard for ages. Uh, and I want to sign it to Rough Trade, I want to put this single out. And it was like, okay, bullseye, that's what we're going to do. The Smiths and Rough Trade were a perfectly timed marriage. The original impact of the post-punk, new wave and new romantic movements had passed. It was time for something new. That something was indie music. And it began with The Smiths. I grew up on The Smiths. I mean, they defined my teenage years completely. So the first time I saw the name Rough Trade was on the back of Hand in Glove, the first Smith single. I didn't know Jeff Travis, didn't know Rough Trade, I didn't know anybody, I was a schoolboy. But the way I saw it was that it was a battle. It was alternative and independent, and to major record companies, that was a dirty word. They were the enemy, Rough Trade was the enemy. Um, they were seen as just infiltrators out to spoil the party and groups like the Smiths were out to spoil the party for Simple Minds and wet, wet, wet and all this kind of rubbish. You know, it was just rubbish. Facing fierce competition, Rough Trade abandoned the principle of the no ties 50-50 deal and for the first time in its history offered the band a conventional record contract. A long-term deal that guaranteed the label four albums. The majors started inviting us to meetings and got interested in us, but we didn't want to be on a major and Rough Trade didn't want to be majors. It was a really great partnership. Johnny puts the music down on a cassette and he gives me the cassette and I live with the cassette for a few days and I just um, wheedle words into the cassette and then we just all it just happens at the drop of a cassette. Rough Trade gave the Smiths independent credibility. Morrissey and Marr put their new label into the charts at number 25, with release number 136. When this Charming Man came out, it wasn't just that things were going in the right direction. I mean, it, it, the, it was like the sun came out for the label and the band and the fans and fans of indie music. 
there was a big difference between this charming man and Club Tropicana. You know, there was a big fucking difference to me. It meant the world to me that I could explain what that difference was to almost everybody I met. I would go out tonight, but I haven't got a stitch to wear. What they made me recognise was that pop records were a great art form. Three minutes could change your life completely, or they could make you get out of the dreary existence you had and save you from it. To promote its first hit single, Rough Trade hired London Records, a major label sales force, and mounted an expensive marketing campaign. I would go out tonight, but I haven't got a stitch to wear. It was certainly unusual for Rough Trade to be spending a lot of money on this blanket poster campaign. But it wasn't an issue of them sitting around going, oh, you know, does it go against our principles? They were like, we've got a record that demands a poster campaign. Fantastic, it's all going to come together. They were still Rough Trade Records, doing things in an independent way, and they had a band who wanted to be with them who were about to have this big run of singles. And they were high on the success they were about to have as a label, and we were high on our success. And it was like a perfect kind of union at that time. A string of Smith's hits followed, but there were internal murmurings of discontent as rough trade sales strategies began to mimic the marketing machines of the major labels. Their LP called The Smiths is coming out on February the 24th and they've got a hit single called What Difference Does It Make? You break a single the first week, right? And then the third week is crucial. Does it drop or does it go up to 36? Here they are, The Smiths. This week's number 20, What Difference Does It Make? If it goes up to 36, oh, you might break it. Get a plugger. You start getting more and more professionals in, more and more expertise. You apply these, you know, these devices to this thing and try to make it happen in some terms. You start playing the game. Number 23 this week, The Smiths. Would you like to marry me? And if you like to come by the ring. I can remember Jeff saying to me one day that Morrissey was going to be the new boy George. And I remember thinking, is that what I'm coming to work for? Is that what we really need? And I, I, I mean, I just, I was astounded that there was that kind of change. We only have one thing to say to that. But heaven knows I'm miserable now. Things had changed. I had appointments at Vernon Yard with the guy who ran Virgin Records, and I was negotiating with him about how many signed copies of Smith's records he was going to get, who was going to get the T-shirts. Suddenly we had licensing in Germany, Austria, the gas territories, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. Uh, suddenly, you know, it's in Japan, we have a record out. You got to satisfy Woolies, you got to satisfy our price, you got to satisfy Virgin, you got to satisfy HMV. You're part of a machine. For the label, I think it was a, definitely a period of re-evaluation internally, you know, because it was really, it was a quite dogmatic, this collective, democratic, immovable model that it had set itself up as. But it really needed to move forward, and Jeff in particular, I think, wanted that and knew that. They were the best group around. They were making music, but even though it was strange, it was still hugely commercial potential. And I think if we were going to have any chance of keeping them, and perhaps by then I would got fed up of losing these artists and, and thought, well, you know, we need to do this job properly now. Rough Trade was becoming more business orientated. In 1984, Richard Scott secured the lease on a warehouse near King's Cross and the company left its spiritual home in West London. This would be the new headquarters of a now global outfit with offices throughout Europe and in America. Rough trade had never been so big or so profitable. Qualified professionals were recruited to manage its growth and they demanded changes to the business that meant sacrificing many of Rough Trade's original collective values. I 
think that too much of the record industry is like the civil service where there's a fear of making a decision in case you make a mistake. And if you make no decision, you can't make a mistake, therefore you keep your job. But that's not how rock and roll got started. Suddenly, it had gone from being me and a few other crazy people into something that was about 40, 60, 80, 100 people, and it was a big organization. And with the big organization came a board which met to make decisions, and an influx of a more professional middle management kind of creature who spoke a kind of language which just was gobbledygook. It was lingo, it was kind of something they learned from a book, and that really was not helpful. I was one of those people. I mean, I was one of those middle managers that was brought in. Still in that period where everybody was being paid the same salary, 7,800 pounds. And you really couldn't get people to come in and manage it for 7,800 pounds. In 1987, Jeff Travis and a handful of the original staff handed over control of Rough Trade to a management trust. It meant the introduction of differential pay and departmental structures. A whole new way of working. It was just a very difficult transition, you know? And it was a hard transition for Jeff, you know? I mean, he was turning over something that he started to other people who, in his mind, probably had no vested interest in music. You know? We didn't care less about the music, which was as far removed from what Rough Trade was, you know, when it first started. But far from making Rough Trade a leaner outfit, the new structure was bureaucratic and unwieldy and inflamed the ongoing rift between distribution and the record label. There's a power struggle, really. And I think my mistake was that I was not interested in the power struggle. And I was very quickly marginalised on the board so that anything I said, no one took very seriously and distribution went its own way. By that time, there was war between distribution and the record company. You couldn't guarantee you're always going to have a hit record, so sometimes you're having a bad season, right? But distribution's always there, increasing in power, increasing in power, increasing in power, and then we're just, and then Rough Trade gets to be just another label which is served by the distribution company that has started. Panic on the streets of London. War was also brewing on another front. Despite a number one album and six top 20 singles by 1986, the Smiths' relationship with Rough Trade was becoming increasingly antagonistic. Studio time was always at a minimum. For me, that was a bit of a problem. Some records didn't arrive at some places on time occasionally. There was some issue with that joke isn't funny anymore, where I think there weren't enough records pressed. And band have no manager, so the two principal members of the group are dealing with the label. And it's like any relationship, you know, you're spending a lot of time together and there's a lot of issues and a lot of things at stake. So, like, things get blown out of proportion. The Rough Trade weren't exactly blameless, but I don't, it wasn't like a catalogue of catastrophe or anything like that. I mean, Morrissey always used to say things like, we're never on the radio. And of course, they were on the radio. They did have a series of hit records, but I think they just felt they should have more. And I mean, that's understandable, but irrational. I mean, Smiths were not making, you know, anodyne, pretty pop records for 14-year-old girls. Therefore, they're not going to sell as many records as Duran Duran. It's just a fact of life. You have to get used to that, Morrissey. Sweetness, sweetness, I was only joking when I said by rights you should be bludgeoned. During the recording of the third album, The Queen is Dead, in 1986, the Smiths tried to sign to EMI. Yet again, Rough Trade looked set to lose its biggest act. But this time, it had the protection of a contract. We were stupid. We had a couple of people around us who gave us 
incorrect and bad advice. You know, and this lawyer saying, well, go and sign to someone else and shopping for a deal. And we didn't really have the rights to do that. And Rough Trade said, hang on a minute, you know, you owe us a couple more albums. So it caused this sort of like standoff. And then we were told, this record that you're working on is going to be injuncted. This lawyer told me that. And that was a bit of a buzz killer. You know, when you're trying to make a record, like, guess what? It's not going to come out. Right. Because they didn't have a manager, they lacked any kind of voice that gave them some semblance of reality. I think that's what described them. We didn't have a calming, organising presence. And um, that led to a lot of chaos and a lot of drama and a lot of neurosis and ultimately the band's demise. But all of that drama uh, and intensity went into the music. You can hear it in the music. The Queen Is Dead was released on Rough Trade. But after the next record, the Smiths were free to leave. Strange Ways Here We Come was to be their last release on Rough Trade. But the band was falling apart and it would be their last album, full stop. In the end, they signed to EMI, and they never gave EMI a record. I'm the sun and the air. The Smiths' departure was demoralising, but income from their sales continued to roll in long after they'd gone, and the future was far from bleak. To do it once, do it twice, every single time will be twice as nice, really. By 1989, the label had its biggest roster of artists to date including The Wooden Tops and The Sundays, whose debut album reached number four in the UK charts. But indie music was becoming mainstream, as every major label rushed to sign jangly, guitar-driven Smith soundalikes. And 